Hello, everybody. Um, it's six o'clock and welcome to the first of a pair of talks on uh, Ground Zero Master Plans, uh, which you can see in this slide, which is a, a page from our website. Uh, pairs um, and both, both pairs and separates concept of Ground Zero Master Plans, breaking it into the cultural component, which is our our theme for tonight, and then the commercial imperative, the skyscrapers that occupied the site, the commercial projects of um, the Silverstein properties uh, that we will look at it towards the end of October. And for those of you who have um, followed our series on remembering 9-11 before, after, the aftermath, the immediate aftermath, and since, looking back from um, two decades, or the 20th anniversary, back to 9-11, uh, know that we've been uh, searching for the lesser known stories. Uh, and we began with the structural engineers who, and uh, foundation engineers who rushed to the site after 9-11 um, and immediately on the day of 9-11 and then for months afterwards to help with the recovery. And that's an extremely dramatic story uh, that you can now view in video on our website. But I also invite you and draw your attention to next week uh, when next Wednesday, Najib Aboud and Stephen Flynn will talk about the forensic analysis of the collapse of the towers uh, that Najib Aboud led the report um, on uh, and took 10 years in order to, uh, to, to um, resolve and report um, all of the, the studies surrounding the collapse, um, and then broaden out the topic to risk in general. Uh, so the, that pair of talks about engineer stories is something that I think um, was a, a, lesser known, a, a lesser known narrative around the, uh, the immediate after of 9-11 and then is extremely significant in our lives in the span of the two decades. Um, and likewise, um, Ground Zero, which is now once again the World Trade Center site and the World Trade Center Memorial and Museum site, um, has as uh, part as its, its heart, the memorial, um, but also its kind of beating heart, the cultural component which has been introduced on the site. Um, and we have speakers tonight which, um, who, uh, which who know a great deal about this um, and who um, are going to each speak um, individually first and then engage in dialogue ab about their experiences and their analysis of the site. So they are both practitioners um, and designers, um, constructors and, uh, and academics. So uh, I will briefly introduce the, the speakers then I'll do a little bit of a, a quick narrative about Lower Manhattan before 9-11 uh, and some of the attention that the, the Skyscraper Museum has paid to this. Um, and then I will hand it over to Gary Hack, who will be our moderator for the evening. So I'll first introduce Gary, who is an architect, um, a planner, an author, uh, the author of the, the um, impressive uh, tome, the textbook on site planning, uh, professor at MIT and then at the University of Pennsylvania, where he became the Dean of the School of Design there. He is um, also a practitioner uh, as, a, as a planner, um, practicing himself as a as in a planning firm, but also as the head of the planning commission of the, uh, of the city of Philadelphia. So um, both academic theoretician, um, author and, and practitioner. Um, and then um, Gary will do a little bit of a visual introduction uh, and she'll, he'll be followed by um, someone very close to his heart who happens um, to be uh, his wife, Lynn Segalen, uh, who also happens to be a professor of real estate and an author and academic, now professor emeritus at the Columbia Business School and the uh, author of 2016, I, I think, um, the, uh, the, power, the, the book Power at Ground Zero, the politics, money, and um, the remaking of Lower Manhattan. And, and she will um, kind of uh, condense that uh, 900 or so page uh, uh, book into um, some observations on the cultural component. Then Craig Dykers, who is the founding partner of Snowetta, 
um, a firm that is internationally acclaimed wa um, was founded in Norway uh, at, and, uh, and has been based here um, in New York where Craig is the founding partner has been since 2004. He himself is an, an American. Uh, they, that firm um, really emerged on the uh, international scene when they won the competition for the Alexandria Library in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, among his other very significant cultural um, commissions are the Oslo Opera House, uh, the San Francisco Museum of Art, um, and then the public space um, design or redesign of, uh, of Times Square here in New York. So Snowetta has, has um, certainly made its, um, its, its print, placed its imprint um, on uh, 21st century New York. And it, of course, he is here because his firm won the competition in 2004 for, for the, uh, the memorial or the museum pavilion, the only above grade um, cultural um, um, building um, that leads to the museum underground and then the, the parts of the memorial, which are also um, sub, uh, subterranean. Uh, then Lynn Segalen, um, as I mentioned, um, will, uh, will kind of bring insights into the discussion. Um, and the last piece, and also in, in conversation, is Frank Siami, uh, who is the um, chairman of the, the, Frank C of the FJ Siami Construction. And uh, he has been involved in, in Ground Zero um, when Governor Pataki and, and Mayor Bloomberg um, asked him to uh, address the spiraling budget um, spiraling up budget of the memorial um, and, to, um, and to facilitate a path forward in the master plan, which Frank will be um, sharing some of those thoughts and experiences um, tonight. His firm, uh, Siami, has been involved in um, innumerable landmark um, renovations. Um, he also uh, led the central synagogue um, or, or kind of re, um, rehabilitation and restoration after the fire they had there. And right now he's also engaged in the, um, the Frick renovation and, uh, and annex uh, for the Frick Museum. So um, Frank has also um, uh, been involved in the LMDC uh, uh, plans for Ground Zero and um, to kind of cap off his career at Ground Zero, his firm is erecting um, currently the last of the cultural pieces, the Ronald O. o Perlman Performing Arts Center at the north end of the, of the Ground Zero site. So right now I'm gonna leave the screen. Um, I'm going to invite all of you who may have questions that occur to you during the discussion to put them in the chat um, where I will monitor them and try to introduce them into the conversation later. Um, but now I'm going to have um, Gary Hack turn his uh, uh, camera on, um, as will the other speakers. And then Gary will share a screen. Uh, and as the others come on, I will um, leave. Thank you, Carolyn. It's, a, um, it's a, a real pleasure to serve as the moderator for this uh, great group of people that we have this evening. Uh, I simply want to offer a little bit of history so that we can place their comments in a, in a context. Uh, and um, I want to start by noting that the idea of creating culture in lower Manhattan has been a very old desire on the part of people, uh, uh, at least since people started uh, moving down to Tribeca and uh, Battery Park City and, uh, and downtown in the 70s and the 1980s. In fact, uh, Frank Gehry designed a huge new Guggenheim Museum for the Wall Street peers that unfortunately didn't materialize. Uh, when the World Trade Center uh, unfortunately needed to be reconstructed, uh, many people saw this as an opportunity to finally achieve some cultural uses down at, uh, at uh, uh, in lower Manhattan. And uh, after, um, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting process that occurred there because the programming of those cultural facilities was occurring in real time uh, while the buildings were being designed to house them. And uh, there were many, many political and other influences that were affecting uh, what went there. And, uh, and you will uh, hear later from Lindsay Galen about what the politics of that was. Um, and uh, 
what I want to do here is to uh, show uh, uh, some of the ideas about where those cultural facilities should be and what they should be. Uh, after soliciting uh, uh, interest from uh, cultural institutions across the city, four, uh, there was a decision made to include four uh, uh, cultural institutions on the site. One was the 9-11 Museum, of course, the most important. Uh, second, a performing arts center to house the Signature Theater and the Joyce Dance Company. Third, an international freedom center. And fourth, the drawing center. Uh, and so let's take a look at where they might be on the site and how that evolved. Uh, this is the uh, uh, studio Daniel Liebeskind master plan that uh, was the uh, uh, designated uh, winner of the uh, of the uh, competition uh, for how to organize the site. As you can see, it consists of basically three layers of, of uh, uses. One is at the center, uh, a memorial garden. Uh, they had proposed that it would be below ground, uh, and we'll hear how that evolved over time. Uh, then there was a layer of uh, cultural uses surrounding it, both separating it from the uh, commercial uses on the streets around, and also uh, uh, <clears throat> providing uh, uh, connections to that, uh, that Memorial Plaza. And then a third layer of five large office buildings that replaced the 10 million square feet that were destroyed. This image of the, uh, of the Liebeskin proposal uh, shows the relationship between the, uh, the plaza and uh, a above ground museum that was then being proposed. It also shows the slurry wall which was the uh, piece of the site that remained uh, standing after, uh, after the uh, large buildings were destroyed. And, and the studio Levis can propose that that be exposed and left to the public as a reminder of the resilience of the site. Now, I show this image because I want to emphasize that it wasn't the only proposal for cultural uses. The runners up in the master plan competition, the think team, uh, led by Raphael Vignoli, proposed that a framework that frameworks be built as a reminder of the Twin Towers and that cultural uses be inserted at various levels vertically uh, within that framework. A second competition was then held to design the 9-11 memorial. The jurors for the competition, to, competition were signaled strongly that they believed it should be at ground level. They chose perhaps the simplest scheme proposed which was called Reflecting Absence by Michael Arad. A simple unadored plaza would be punctuated by two waterfalls on the footprints of the Twin Towers and ramps connected uh, the ground level to the museum below. In the meantime, the International Freedom Center and the Drawing Center had withdrawn from the site for reasons that Lynn Sigalen will illustrate. There was a general consensus that this uh, the scheme was, uh, was appropriate, but far too bleak. And, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Lower, Lower Manhattan Development Corporation insisted that uh, Michael Arad ally himself with a landscape architect to uh, see if they could find a way to soften the environment and uh, provide uh, uh, shade and uh, other amenities that people visiting would like. And, and this shows the final outcome of that uh, design process that proceeded from there. Uh, by this time, the only piece of the, uh, 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 of the plaza that uh, remained above ground was the visitor pavilion for the 9-11 Museum. And Craig Dykers, who designed it, will uh, discuss this and tell you the ideas that went into it. At, um, uh, as the cost of the uh, museum escalated out of control, Frank Scammy was uh, hired to find a solution that was both dignified and affordable. And the museum and plaza opened to the public in 2011. You'll also see on this image, the Performing Arts Center site, which Frank will also discuss. Now, bringing the, uh, the uh, 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 plaza up to ground level, um, freed an enormous amount of space below ground, below it, uh, which became the place for the museum. As you can see from this image, the idea of exposing the slurry wall was uh, retained from the uh, Liebeskind uh, proposal, in this case, in an enclosed space rather than an outdoor space. And uh, this has become 
uh, an enormous re repository for objects that were discovered after the uh, destruction of the World Trade Center and things that were of meaning and, and, uh, and curated uh, exhibits about the uh, history of that site. Now, Craig Dyker designed an elegant structure uh, to access uh, that uh, museum. Uh, you see it in the center of this image, uh, and it is the only uh, piece of the, uh, of the cultural program which has remained within the plaza, and it uh, is intimately connected to the uh, spaces below ground. Next. Craig will discuss what, how, how they thought about that museum and, uh, and how it's been designed. Uh, early in the, in the process, uh, Frank Gehry was hired to design the Performing Arts Center, and this was a scheme that he uh, proposed. It got mixed reviews, uh, and uh, site circumstances changed, and the original tenants decided uh, against locating there. So there was a need to rethink the structure, and uh, Rex architects were interviewed and hired uh, to design a more flexible space for that center. Um, and um, uh, Frank uh, will describe what it's taken uh, to uh, actually make the new scheme a reality. If you go down to the site today, this is what you will see. This is what you will see. Uh, you will see under construction a, uh, a very different shaped uh, structure than the one that Frank Gehry had designed, a place that uh, provides much more flexibility in its uses and uh, which is uh, probably more attuned to the uh, to the actual uh, uh, cultural uh, dimensions of the, of the of this site. It's become the Ronald O. Perlman Center for the Performing Arts and will open in, in 2023. Next, uh, the final uh, rendering shows the uh, Performing Arts Center as, as Rex has proposed it. It'll be a blowing, glowing uh, beacon with light uh, transmitted through uh, 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 marble uh, 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 cladding on it, uh, and it bring it'll bring uh, activity and life to the center of the World Trade Center in the evening, which is probably when most of the cultural activities will be occur. Now, let me turn the presentation over to Glenn Galen, who will discuss the politics and uh, 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 the locational changes that occurred as a result of them, those politics uh, uh, on the uh, uh, site, which many people considered to be hallowed ground. Lynn? Thank you, Gary. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this panel with uh, Craig and Frank and Carol and uh, of course, Gary. The Perlman Performing Arts Center that's due to open in 2023 really marks a 20 year span from when culture at Ground Zero was first discussed. It will be for most of us the most welcome addition to the site and confirmation of the notion that good ideas do not always die in New York City, but rather often take a very, very long time to come to fruition. For four intense years, from 2002 to 2005, the idea of culture at Ground Zero was a lightning rod for a deeper controversy over how much of the site should be devoted to the memory of those who perished on 9-11 and how much should be devoted to uh, rebuilding the commercial engine that uh, World Trade Center was for Lower Manhattan. In my book, I wrote in detail about the controversy. So tonight I just wanna hit on a few of the highlights. First, from the start of planning for rebuilding, culture at Ground Zero was thought as the living memorial, a way to celebrate life through the arts and in the words of the LMDC, infuse the redevelopment with hope and energy drawn from the human spirit. This ideal was something that even family members at the time uh, agreed upon. Culture was an essential ingredient in the mix that planners and politicians were aiming for, especially for John Whitehead, who chaired the LMDC. He was especially wedded to the idea of having culture at ground zero. And it was because culture was about the future, about healing and about moving forward. Ostensibly, this was a neutral goal, but that assumption turned out to be wrong and politically naive as we all learned in the process. 
The controversy over culture broke out when the four cultural institutions, which Gary mentioned, were selected as part of an invitation issued by the LMDC. Uh, in particular, the International Freedom Center and the Drawing Center uh, became a deep source of controversy uh, uh, that lasted uh, quite a long time. The controversy was set off by a small activist group of families of the victims, who I have argued didn't want any competition for attention diverted from their losses. Their voices took on an outsized impact in the debate about culture on the site. The size of the proposed design for the culture center set off controversy from the beginning. From their perspective, the perspective of the families, culture threatened to take away, as they said, their property. And so culture really became, a controversy over culture became a controversy over, over what meaning would prevail. Was it gonna be remembrance or rebuilding? the memory of those who lost their lives on that tragic day, or the future office workers, tourists, and residents who would come to inhabit the site. This fight was a fierce fight. The issue rapidly became politicized, and once politicized, it became impossible to get the cultural program back on track, at least back on track at that point in time and under the original plan. The politics of saying no to the families to the emotional claims of the families was not possible. No politician could do it. I remember when I interviewed Governor Pataki, I asked him about this. I asked him that exact question. And his body language and eventually his voice told me that the answer was no. Mayor Bloomberg tried to um, uh, say no to the families, but he was pushed back and, and failed to do so. So the International Freedom Center was the most controversial element. It was conceived as a tribute to the idea of freedom and its struggles. And it was intended as an intellectual and educational complement to the emotional experience uh, of the spiritual memorial. It was supposed to help us understand the event of 9-11, its context and history, it was supposed to be a way to educate future generations not yet born for whom 9-11 would always be history. Well, this was too much for a small vocal group of activist family members who saw in the IFC and more broadly the cultural program costing a focus on memorialization. The second trigger uh, to the controversy was an ideologically driven op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by Deborah Burlingame called the Great Ground Zero Heist. The cultural program was going to be a prominent building. The cultural center was going to be a prominent building on Ground Zero with a multifaceted agenda. And that was a problem for Burlingame whose brother was a pilot on the, the flight uh, that flew, that was hijacked in, and flown into the Pentagon, and the activist family group who wanted nothing to interfere with the memorialization of their lost ones. This was a reprise of the not forgotten, not forsaken quest that the entire site be given over to a memorial. After months of intense controversy and protests, including a boycott of the fundraising for the Memorial Foundation, and constant attention from the press, the situation became politically untenable for Governor Pataki, who decided that the only solution was to evict the International Freedom Center from the site. The drawing center was already, which had already been controversial because of the nature of what it proposed to exhibit, uh, had decided to withdraw. The families had won and Pataki had unilateral, his, and Pataki's unilateral decision-making once again undermined the, the legitimacy of the institution that he created to guide the planning and execution of Rebuilding Ground Zero, the LMDC, which had been tasked with responsibility for managing the process for the culture program. The controversy over culture was a very sad chapter 
in the history of rebuilding Ground Zero, and for New York especially, a city so proud of its liberal tradition of tolerance. This conflict had a lasting impact on the rebuilding process and really infected the public tenor of the rebuilding process, hard as that may seem now, some 15 years after the intense controversy is over. In time, and as Craig and Frank will talk about several design and program iterations, a performing arts center is being built today, fortunately. Without a question, without a doubt, this is an achievement and it will represent the future and it will exist, coexist with the memorial, with the museum, and with the commercial program of the rebuilt World Trade Center. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, um, I want to now turn to Craig Dykers, who, whose uh, building is uh, uh, central to this uh, whole story and, uh, and who had a large role in sorting out the conflicts that uh, were occurring uh, over the uh, cultural institutions. Craig, uh, uh, describe to us uh, your involvement and, uh, and your ideas that you brought to the site uh, as you uh, began to design the uh, the, the, what's now uh, considered to be the visitor pavilion. Um, well, it was a, a tremendous introduction and very accurate. Um, there are so many ways to describe this story. It's a bit like a hydra. You chop off a head and a new one grows and each one has its own story. So all of us will have different perspectives and I'm not sure there's any single perspective that can be considered absolutely accurate. Um, but I'll share with you some of the characteristics I understood of culture at the site. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was that the Lower Manhattan Development uh, Group were trying to create a river to river walk along Fulton Street that would uh, saddle alongside the World Trade Center site connecting the World Financial Center with the seaport and re uh, envisioning the whole of Lower Manhattan through this kind of corridor. You can see that on the left. That corridor at the corner of uh, basically Liberty or Fulton uh, and West Broadway uh, at the northeast corner of the World Trade Center a memorial site was uh, often referred to as the cultural nexus. So in the northwest uh, quadrant of that circle, the black circle on the left would be the Performing Arts Center. In the uh, southwest uh, quadrant would be the museum. In the southeast quadrant, you would have the train station. And in the northeast quadrant, you would have one of the commercial structures sharing that cultural nexus. And on the right side of this image, you can see um, the location of what was at that time called the museum complex, housing, as mentioned earlier, the International Freedom Center and the Drawing Center. Uh, this is post Liebeskin's plan. Uh, and it was uh, a very unusual spot to be. Everything was kind of staring at it. And it was indeed highly controversial uh, related to the notion of culture. I, I will just give you quickly a private uh, sort of aside. Um, my father, who was in the US Army, served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And originally, I wasn't interested necessarily in participating at this site. Um, friends of mine suggested I look further into it. And as I realized that the value of culture here I thought my father, who, who loved culture, uh, you know, uh, spent his life serving this country to protect things like culture. And I felt it was my duty uh, to follow in his footsteps and uh, work with this project here. So it was quite valuable to, to me personally. Um, as the, much as people talk about the master plan, we talked about the master section. So if you look at this section through the site, you'll see that the memorials on the left were incised into the earth. Uh, they were contemplative and emotional. The commercial skyscrapers were above the ground, towering in, into the sky, in a way, cutting into the sky. They're about the future. They're productive and commercial. Our project, which is the little thing in the middle, was the only thing on the, on the Memorial Plaza itself. And it sort of occupied an interesting space between what was underground and what was above ground. And so we saw that this world is in a temporal way, that the memorials were about the past, the skyscrapers and the commercial structures were about the future. And the museum was about the present in time, that fleeting moment where uh, you see yourself and you see the life around you existing, and then it disappears into the past and at the, simultaneously while you're thinking about the future. And so this was the master section as we saw it. Um, instead of reflecting absence, we were uh, mirroring presence on the site. 
And uh, the original design and, and, and uh, prerogative of this project was to occupy the entire uh, northeast corner of the Memorial Quadrant uh, in a way that was similar to Liebeskin's master plan in the upper left. Uh, as Michael Rodsky uh, built this uh, uh, at-grade uh, sort of plaza without vegetation and with no structures on it, he removed all of those structures in his original proposal. Uh, that eventually transformed to a series of other structures that were proposed for the museum alongside West Avenue, as you can see on the lower uh, left uh, image. And then finally, our project for the Freedom Center and the Drawing Center, which, as was mentioned earlier, was quite large. And so there was already controversy stirring as to whether or not its scale was appropriate for the site, even if many people uh, thought that cultural components were interesting. Uh, the Drawing Center actually had a rather stiff challenge politically, too, even slightly before the, uh, the International Freedom Center. Both were actually fairly liberal organizations and wanted to approach culture in an interesting and intellectual way, but this was seen to be problematic since culture can't necessarily be controlled in a democratic society. And the lack of control scared many people. So things were already beginning to get kicked out of the building. And uh, at that point in time, of course, we were under severe stress. And I remember this newspaper headline in the Architects newspaper in 2005, Pray for Snow, because we were, <laughs> we were under serious uh, distress at that time if people wanted to know what would happen. And even then, uh, former President Trump uh, was already talking about rebuilding the trade towers as they were originally and knocking everything off the site. So it was a, a crazy time. But here's the master plan on the left following uh, this is post Daniel Liebeskind and post uh, Michael Arad, and it's the intermediate period. And the picture on the right is actually the picture that was given to the architects who were asked to uh, make proposals for the museum complex that housed the Freedom Center and the Drawing Center. So that was a kind of awkward adaptation of a Liebeskind design showing you where it could be. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, after a series of, of changes, we moved through uh, uh, an, an option where we were going to, uh, after the Freedom Center left and the Drawing Center left, we still felt committed to the idea of culture on the site. And so we, we were trying very hard to, to keep that idea alive. And so we proposed um, a small stru smaller structure. And I should add a few other interesting challenges here. Uh, that northeast corner of the site actually was meant to have a skylight for the underground transportation hub designed by Santiago Calatrava. In addition to all of the problems with po po politics of the political, we had the politics of the architects. So the uh, memorial designers wanted a site free of a building. Uh, the transportation hub designer wanted to clear off everything over the hub. And the Performing Arts Center was trying to grab that corner of the cultural nexus since it was the only uh, cultural center left. And so all of these things were happening simultaneously. We proposed a visitor center and then Frank Siami uh, became involved and we worked with him and a team. Uh, and it was transformed from a visitor center into the entrance to the below grade museum, which was a big uh, 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 shift in thinking and allowed uh, this project to remain at least some component of culture even if it uh, wasn't housing a museum. The problem was that underground, everything was quite messy and we had to, to build our building as though it were a bridge across the site. This is the first study model we made of the uh, original uh, design for the visitor center before it became the museum uh, pavilion. And to give you an idea of the complexity, uh, here's a diagram on the left that shows you all the layers of all the structures, one on top of the other, and a picture of the construction site where we had to accommodate the MTA subway lines. We had to accommodate the path center lines. We had to accommodate museum structure. We had to accommodate path uh, uh, loading uh, platform structure. And we had to accommodate our own structure all in one. It was the corner where everything happened all at once. It was extremely difficult, uh, which is why uh, the cost uh, became uh, quite a challenge. And finally, we resulted in this uh, project, which <clears throat> really followed the original vision that we had shared, even when the project was much bigger. And that was that we wanted a building that was optimistic in many ways, that reflected light, that generated light without necessarily the use of electricity, a beacon or a lantern on the site that would give you a sense of security at night. And just to give you a, a little idea of what you're looking at here, the picture on the right is actually the north face of the building. It never receives direct sunlight ever. 
uh, but it's always a light because it's capturing the ambient light and reflections off of the skyscrapers around it. So it really is a, a, a true kind of lantern made from the sun. And uh, as we all know, uh, the, the, the sky quality on September 11th was such an important uh, component of people's memory on that day. Inside are two of the original steel structures that we had to actually negotiate their location because some people wanted to put them back where they were originally placed outside on the memorial. We went through a long series of studies uh, and ended up with this location, which is not where they originally were. But strangely enough, without our knowing it, we later found out they're looking at their original location, which was the uh, south uh, uh, east corner of the North Tower. As people look into the building, they see these, uh, these beautiful and magnificent, but somewhat uh, 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 ominous structures inside. And then they see their reflections also. And I'm going to conclude by showing one last slide because uh, when people approach the building, they see their reflections and they suddenly see themselves in a moment in time. And that is, is uh, over, overlaid against the artifacts inside the building. But many people like to uh, share the, this moment of presence, this moment in time of their being alive at this place of so much tragedy. And I remember I snapped this picture once of a young girl dancing with her mother just behind taking a, a picture, which is not really a selfie of her because it's in the reflection of the building where she's capturing her, her daughter's image. But it was that moment of that smile where I realized that this site can mean something to both those who are mourning the loss and those who are looking forward to a life in the future. And that really is what culture is about here. Thank you, Craig. It's a, it's a wonderfully elegant building. And uh, and uh, if you had to have just one building on that plaza, I think you've done the perfect one uh, for it. Uh, let me now turn to Frank uh, uh, Scarami, uh, who uh, is the builder uh, who has help make all of these things possible. Both uh, worked with Craig on the, uh, on the uh, rationalization of the program and, uh, and the siting of the entrance to the 9-11 uh, Museum uh, and how to make it uh, economically possible. And, and now is uh, constructing the Performing Arts Center. So he's been, been central to, to, the, to both of the institutions that uh, are gonna occupy the site. Uh, Frank, tell us about some of the ways that you got involved in this, what some of the hurdles were you had to overcome and, uh, and tell us uh, uh, what you think uh, the future holds for these, uh, for these structures. Okay, happy to do that. And it's great to be part of this, this panel. Um, I'm not going to have many images until maybe the end. We could put a couple of images up of the Performing Arts Center. But I guess my story, well, my story started on 9-11. Uh, we were at our building on 80 South Street and we're downtown when the planes hit. Um, that day was, you know, etched in my mind as it was etched in the minds of so many forever. Um, we finally got our people out. Uh, waiting because I didn't really recommend anyone leaving. We were able to look down at the FDR drive with the people all running over the Brooklyn Bridge and the fire trucks and ambulances heading south. But eventually, when we had that all available boats call, uh, it was an amazing thing to watch. And all the boats came to the harbor and people left on boats to Long Island, Brooklyn, New Jersey. It was great. At that time, we were working on the Toys R Us project and my super said, none of us are leaving. We have 100 men until you tell us we're not needed at ground zero. And that forced us to walk down there. And, and it was a site that's etched in my mind forever. There was nothing anyone could do. And I eventually got home. Um, years later, around 2006, I get a call from Governor Pataki and Mayor Bloomberg asking me if I would try to align the memorial design with the budget that had spiraled out of control from 500 million to 970 million. Well, when the governor and the mayor call, you say you have no choice but to say yes. Never. Next time I will assess the minefields. I don't care if the president calls. I would think about what I was getting into. But we did get involved. And after I got that call, the press release was sent out. And I think Jack Rudin must get every press release, used to get rest his soul, every press release that left City Hall. And he called me and asked if I needed anything. He said, lavender, my lavender. And that was the city college. He was a city college alum, as was I. 
And in any case, they said, Jack, this is bigger than me. I have to surround myself with the best people in this town. Would you be the head of my advisory committee? He agreed. And with that, I was able to bring in some of the best people in this town. Uh, we had Tom Main, the architect, Mephorsis, Rick Cook, Peter Clayman, Rick Bell, the AIA head, and eight other advisors that had us work together. But there was one thing that, that I had said to the governor and the mayor, I would do it on one condition. If I was given the responsibility, I had to have the authority. And whatever came out of this, they had to allow me to recommend. They agreed. And the, the guiding principle was to create a fitting memorial to all those lost on September 11th and to adhere to Michael Arad's vision of reflecting absence. I didn't think it was appropriate to change that design, which was an award-winning design through all the competitions. The stakeholders were enormous. You had the designers, you had Michael Arad, Peter Walker, Max Bond, uh, Craig, thank God Craig was involved. He was a voice of reason. Uh, the families, the Family Advisory Council, the Memorial Mission Statement Drafting Committee, the governor, the Port Authority, huge number of stakeholders. But the families were very tense. They had been through a lot and they didn't see this getting anywhere. And I really wanted to be sensitive to what was important to them. So we worked through a number of designs, uh, getting input from many different people. And one of the most controversial issues at the time was whether the names should be above grade or below grade. Michael Arad had the names below grade and you would be looking through the waterfall, but it had all kinds of security issues, technical issues, noise issues. You couldn't be there for more than four minutes without the waterfalls pounding. And I didn't know how to, to get through this. Well, one of the family members recommended that I talk to Maya Lind, who was the head of the jury. And I met Matt Meyer on a Sunday night and asked her, Maya, what was important to this design? Uh, and she said the reflecting absence on the spot where the towers were, the waterfalls. And I kept saying anything else. And she said, no. I said, what about the uh, underground galleries? And she said, what underground galleries and waterfall? So they didn't even, she didn't even think that it was important to the design and neither did the rest of the jurors when I questioned them. So that was a big issue in terms of where the names would be and there was a lot of savings. I think that saved about a hundred million dollars. We went through five different options. There was the option where it would be just a reflecting pool on the plaza and you would have the water but no waterfall. We had an above grade uh, thought where this would be in the Freedom Tower. The museum would be in the Freedom Tower there would be a memorial below grade, museum below grade with the pits, but no waterfall um, and maybe one other option. But what ended up happening is we were able to keep the waterfall as originally designed. We changed the entrance. There was a entrance pavilion on the west side of the site that was costing about $40 million. And then there was this so-called visitor center which was Craig's site, which I felt could be the entrance to the museum, saved that money. We convinced the Port Authority that if they had come, and I gotta tell you that Peter Lear and Roland Betts and Bovis had done a lot of work on this. We used their estimates, their numbers, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for the work they did. But we eventually were able to give the waterfalls, allow for the museum below grade, eliminate the entrance pavilion and, and, and convince the Port Authority that if we just built to grade, it would have cost them $240 million. And I'll never forget the heated argument with Tony Kosher, where he said, well, we're not giving you any money. And I said, Tony, how's it gonna look if I say that the five and $10 donations are going to something the Port Authority should do? To get a park on grade would cost this money. It's not fair for the museum to pay it. Well, we negotiated. The Port Authority wanted control of the site, which we gave them. And they then gave about 125 million towards the project. At the end of the day, we ended up coming close to 
the 500 million, I think it was $520 million. We presented it to the governor, the mayor, they liked it. And then there was a vote by most of the public. And it was, it was pretty uh, positive. I think it was like 80% of the people were in favor, including the families. So I got great satisfaction out of being able to pretty much find a way to save the design and align it with the budget. Uh, but that, that was the story there. And I'll tell you that one of the last people I spoke to, rest his soul, was John Whitehead. And John was light years ahead of everyone else. Um, and I said to John, John, any comments? And he said, Frank, I really don't care what you do with the memorial, whether the names are above grade, whether the names are below grade, it's gonna work itself out, but don't touch the Performing Arts Center. Culture is so vital to Ground Zero and so vital to Lower Manhattan, that has to stay. Well, it wasn't really part of what we were thinking anyway, but who would have thought that 15 years later that we would have the opportunity to build the Performing Arts Center at Ground Zero. And we're having a lot of fun building that, working with Leslie Koch, the dynamic president of the Perlman Performing Arts Center. And as you see in the rendering, what it is gonna be according to Leslie Koch is a, at the public level, which is above those steps that you see in the rendering, the public level will be open to the public free. The restaurant won't be free, but the place to get into you'll be free and it will be a living room for the ground zero it's something that wants to be opened up the theater will be very flexible which was very important there will be 11 different configurations the maximum capacity for the largest theater will be around 1200 people and i think they're going to have some really really interesting programs in there the curtain wall is a composition of stone and glass the stone is 12 millimeters thick, and then it is sandwiched between two lights of glass. And then the assembly is added an insulated piece of glass. That becomes a stone and glass panel, which looks like a reflective marble because of how thin the stone is. That is made in three foot by five foot panels. And then we stack five of them for what we call mega panels that will be 12 foot by five foot. And they're installed on the vertical mullions if we had a picture. If you go by the site now, you'll see the vertical mullions and the panels are about to begin to be installed next month in October. And by the end of the year, we will have the facade substantially complete with the exception of where the hoist is. It won't be glowing uh, as, as it will eventually be. It'll eventually have this golden glow at night and I think it will be really welcoming for the people that go to the performances, as Gary said, which most of the time will take place at night. So um, that's my experience with Ground Zero. And uh, again, it's been great working with so many great people and seeing New York rally around this project uh, in terms of getting the memorial to work was, was a highlight of, of my life. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, a great description of uh, of the issues that you had to deal with and uh, how you made uh, these things happen. And I think we've set something of a record, set something of a record for uh, for um, the, the skyscraper museum presentations and actually making it on time and leaving a little bit of time <laughs> for discussion and for uh, uh, for questions that you might have. Uh, um, uh, Carol, how do you want to proceed with this? Do you have uh, some questions that have come in over the uh, uh, over the internet to you, or uh, do you have a few things you would like uh, them to focus on? Well, I, I could certainly pose some questions, and I don't have any in the chat now, though I have invited people to offer uh, theirs, but um, we'll, we'll wait and see if they oblige. Um, but it, it seems to me that there may well be some responses, Lynn, for example, to um, Frank's uh, discussion of both the families and the and the budget cuts and how successful that was. Oh, and, and I do want to um, apologize to Gary for, for his... Uh, introduction, which neglected to mention that he had served on the team for the Leibskin Studios
competition uh, for the in the master plan, the winning competition um, entry in the master plan, um, and then he was involved all the way along uh, the Liebskin participation uh, in the in master planning the site uh, and uh, his experience there individually, but also um, his kind of professional and academic um, focus on on site planning and landscape is um, it brings in uh, a particularly important point in the design. I know I know Gary thinks it's important, um, and uh, you know as, as certainly um, I do. Uh, the the landscaping and the Peter Walker addition of the trees and the um, the, the creation of a of a, a, a verdant public space rather than the fairly arid Arad um, original design, which to which I don't think we gave quite enough credit. And um, I, I will mention that last week that Gary Craig, um, Frank and I met on the site while then was a little bit indisposed. Um, and it was a, just a joy to meet there under the trees on a hot day next to the southeast corner of the waterfall, um, which was cool and shaded because of these 10 year old trees which are are really transforming the site with time and gary you can speak to that much better than i can so i thought so i thought you might want to um underscore the importance of the landscaping on the on the plaza site yeah well i think what you experience today is uh, is really uh, uh the result of the uh extraordinary moves that were made in adding landscape to michael arad's uh, scheme uh, the uh, uh, the uh, as powerful as the uh, as the waterfalls are, and uh, as the uh, uh, remembrance of all the names of people who were lost are surrounding those water waterfalls. In fact, as an environment, uh, it's a it's an environment that you want to be in, in part in large part because of the trees, the maple trees that were were. Uh, uh, were added uh, to it, uh, oak trees. I'm sorry, and uh, and the uh, and the uh, groundscape that was uh, that was done as as part of it. I should just want to correct one thing, which is that I did in fact help on the uh, studio Liebeskind uh, uh, team, but the maestro of the scheme was Daniel Liebeskind. We shouldn't uh, in any way uh, 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 discount that. And uh, and in fact, it was. Uh, it was a, an idea that's that's held up in some real sense through the uh, through the siting of buildings and uh, and the uh, creation of each of the pieces. Each new designer that's come come uh, aboard has actually added uh, their creativity to it. And so these kinds of uh, places and cities are not formed by one mind or or one uh, one set of plans. They're they they evolve. Actually, one of the most important things I think about the uh, the cultural uh, um, uh, program is that it was done in real time while the planning was being done. So there were no programs for the cultural institutions at the time the first buildings were being shown on the on the site. And, uh, and then as the programs evolved and uh, as people came and went and uh, as the institutions uh, uh, were uh, better conceived of, it, it all evolved. And, uh, and that's a rare thing to have happen. Architects often say, you know, give me a chance to determine the program of the building, not just the form that it takes. And that was truly the case here. Uh, it is also very hard to do because of the politics of, uh, of, of deciding that. And I appreciated uh, all those comments. Uh, Lynn, do you want to uh, uh, add some yeah, more comments I, to I the, wanna, uh, what we've heard? Yeah, I want to say something. I want to say at least two things. One is what's reflected, and this is a comment to the audience, what's reflected in the comments that, that each of us have made is that working on ground zero on the rebuilding was an emotional experience that had no parallel. I mean, I worked on my book, Power Ground Zero for 12 years and I interviewed everybody. It was about 180 interviews and everybody had the same kind of emotional commitment to making this the best experience, the best project that they their, their relevant expertise could bring to the site. The second thing I would say, I would, uh, it has to do with the public space. The Memorial Quadrant is approximately eight acres. 
of open space that is landscaped and it is an environment. It is not so common to find eight acres of open space in Manhattan that has a meaning for all, has diverse meanings for the diversity of the people who come there. And I think Craig said this, this best. I mean, you each, everybody brings their own, their own stories, their, their own meaning to the place. But to be able to do that in such a superb setting um, is special. There aren't many places in New York and where that can happen. We have Central Park, but that's a whole different environment than you have at Ground Zero. So the size and scale, as well as the quality of the environment, I think is really has an impact on people visiting there. Another challenge with that, interestingly, is uh, the notion of pro programming outdoor space. We often talk about programming what's inside buildings, but of course, outdoor space can either be programmed or controlled as much as any indoor space, sometimes even more. There were lots of discussions about whether or not even dogs or pets could be allowed on the site, if that would be considered inappropriate in terms of urban culture and urban life. Um, there were even uh, great periods where it was thought that groups couldn't gather on the site that were driven by security concerns. Um, so it, even, even this, this eight acres uh, or close to eight acres of, of space went through cultural upheavals beyond yeah. the fact that it had a memorial. Yeah, and even the way the names were going to be placed, which wasn't really part of, of, of what I did, but everything was so important. And if the, if the names were underground, you would have had to go through a security check. You would have had to have been online. There would have been a short amount of time to be there. And I was concerned that you would never go down. You know, maybe the family members would, but for the most part, the public might go down once and that would be the end of it. But looking at that um, plaza and more often right now that I'm doing the pack and it's only blocks from my office, it really works. I mean, the trees, the, the plaza, the names, seeing the people interface with the names uh, every day. I think, I think it was a very successful, uh, pro and, I, and I think uh, entering through Craig's museum is powerful uh, rather than what would have just been a pavilion to get down to the museum. So sometimes saving money, I think adds benefit to a project. And in, in the case of how you enter the museum, I think that that was the case. I should say maybe quickly something I, I didn't get to mention, which is also intriguing, was that although um, Frank's work helped develop the entrance to the museum, there was a period of time where everything was basically dead on the site. There was no visitor center. There was uh, no entrance really other than the ramps that were mentioned. There were, the, the site was cleared off. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, there was this notion that culture had value at the site somehow. So we went, uh, a couple of us, to um, visit the governor at that time, Pataki. This was before Frank was involved and just discussed the notion of creating this, this cultural center, whatever it might have in it. For a while, it was even going to be a kind of youth center. It was one of the things that was discussed. Um, before it became the entrance to the museum. And the governor uh, believed in it at, and said, yes, we must have culture there in addition to the performing arts center that was being discussed. And so he uh, delivered uh, funding to the project when actually all the funding had been removed. And I thought that was quite impressive of the governor at that time. Yeah. Well. The uh, Performing Arts Center is going to be the real test about whether this can become a <laughs> culture of the future as well. And, uh, and uh, uh, the flexibility that it has uh, gives me some confidence that, in fact, they will attract groups to come and invent uh, new forms of culture in that, uh, in that uh, structure, rather than uh, uh, being a kind of static uh, uh, piece of the, uh, of the cultural life. Uh, and uh, but uh, I guess I one question I have, Craig, is that is Gary, that, is know, that Josh, uh, by losing. Josh, go ahead, sir. Say, Joshua, yeah. Joshua Ramos, the founder of Rex, uh, he really is concentrating on that flexibility and how this building could work in so many different ways. I think you're going to find that it will be very flexible 
and it's going to bring tremendous cultural value to to lower manhattan and uh i can't wait for opening night yeah. I, uh, I wonder if they, uh, I, was, I was going to ask both you and Craig the question, if uh, if the uh, uh, International Freedom Center and the Drawing Center were intended to be a place where people could reflect on the meaning of, uh, of um, that event that destroyed the uh, center and, uh, uh, and its connection to wider uh, issues of democracy and uh, and expression of uh, views and, and all the rest of it. Um, hopefully, uh, some of that can occur in the in the Performing Arts Center and the programs that are that are mounted there. Uh, but uh, is there a way that this uh, site can also evolve over time with other kinds of uh, institutions or other kinds of activities? I, uh, have I, you thought about that? Uh, I should mention quickly that uh, the museum pavilion. Uh, had as a part of its programming to have a small theater building, a theater space. Uh, so there is actually a, a theater room on the second level. Um, I don't remember the specific number of seats, but it's about 200-ish people. Um, and actually we made that room, we fitted it out so that it could be used for all kinds of activities in addition to the ordinary activities of showing a film or orientation type film uh, before people go below ground. Uh, that was risky because uh, unlike the uh, Performing Arts Center, which is outside of the memorial site, uh, we were opening the door once again to what should happen on the memorial grounds. We always believed that there should be a balance between the focus on the events of September 11th and earlier in, in uh, uh, for, uh, earlier events on that site. But we also wanted to look again forward to the future. That, that uh, room has been used. Actually, I think Tribeca Film Festival once used, or maybe more than once, that, that, that little theater inside the museum pavilion. So there is a possibility to use it in different ways. Also, the museum itself has a programming narrative that has allowed other people to come into the, to the museum and use it in a number of ways in, in relation to functional functions and events that aren't 100% related to, to the um, events of September 11th. So uh, I think on site, there is, a, is, is that capacity to balance uh, the museum that reflects uh, the tragedies that occurred there and events of everyday life and the future. That coupled with the Performing Arts Center across the street, which will be more, in many ways, more powerful as a cultural institution uh, about life in, in the city. Uh, the, the two things can work together, I believe. Then if you add to that the possibility, very small as it might be, that the next round of re, uh, commercial structures and skyscrapers could incorporate more culture into their uh, functions, we could see further development. The problem is security remains really quite high. And, and actually, since you're on the call, Frank, I guess there's a lot of, uh, still uh, actually a lot of security in that, in that building. Uh, that's being oh, built for the performing arts. The performing arts, the, there are total hardened walls, uh, all the exit stairs, uh, the, it's 240 pounds per square foot in terms of steel. A normal building would be around 60 pounds per square foot. I think you could put 20 stories on top of that building. <laughs> uh, but Craig, you, you bring up a good point. You know, post COVID, the world is changing. Commercial real estate is trying to redefine what it will actually be like. Retail is different. I think when Tower 2, I guess it's the last tower to go up, does go up, there may be some real opportunities for culture in a way that hasn't been thought of before. And if the retail space below grade is not doing so well, some great spaces down there that might also have culture or other uses. So I think there is a, a possible path to more culture uh, at ground zero as, as we enter the post-pandemic world. I wanna, I wanna say something about that, which is most observers of big large scale projects believe that, oh, it should get done. There's a program, there's a, there are designs, it should get done. But I'm of the belief, and it's been proven in a couple of big projects in New York, that sometimes delay is the handmaiden of success. Absolutely. The fact that Tower 2 is not complete, the fact that Site 5, which does have a program now, which was also controversial as to how that would be rebuilt, 
it allows for the evolution of the, the, the environment, the market to shape for the long term what happens on the site. Whereas if everything were built simultaneously in you know 10 years and it was all done by 2015, it might not be as flexible as it might as it's likely to be going forward because you've had these interludes of uh, market delay and controversy and the evolution of ideas. So I, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm I, of the belief that <laughs> Lynn, I think that it's done all has its silver uh, lining. <laughs> you know, time filters one's thoughts. You know, I always say that. You know, time will filter your thoughts. What you want to do a year ago could be different now, and I, I couldn't agree more. I yeah. think that taking some time helped. The, the challenge here is that these are kind of rhetorical opportunities. It's impossible to, to actually define what should or should not have happened. Uh, there was so much, as you mentioned earlier, trauma and strange uh, and difficult pathways to healing. Uh, you know, at one, on one hand, taking one's time uh, would have been helpful. On the other hand, the trauma of having an open wound was too much for most people to bear. So the speed uh, was, was an issue that had to deal with healing and the time had, was an issue that had to do with intellectualizing. What happened was some sort of confl confluence of all of those worlds together. And I would say you have the other side of that uh, coin, which is if you to use too much time, you lose momentum and, and, and momentum is a, is a valuable resource on a project as complex as this. Yeah, but by the time, right. you know, by the time of 2016, I know when my book came out, you had 80% of that site rebuilt. And so uh, to your point, Craig, about momentum, as long as you had such a, a large critical mass in place, yeah, you know, you, you could allow the evolution of ideas to happen. Yeah. But if only 40% of the site had been rebuilt, it would have been a very different story. Yeah. I think we shouldn't minimize also the uh, additional uh, cultural uh, institution that's uh, being built right now, which is the uh, Orthodox Church that's uh, being reconstructed on that site. And that adds another kind of dimension to the, to the site. Uh, uh, that makes connections to people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise be there if their if their place of worship worship wasn't there and and there may be other ways over time that some of those uh, retail spaces can be, get converted into uh, into uh, performance spaces of one kind or another as retail is moving towards performance and uh, and uh, and I think that. Uh, uh, it, we have to think of this as a dynamic place that's going to change and continue to change and evolve and new ideas will come along that uh, that uh, we'll see. You'll wonder why we didn't think of that before and uh, <laughs> and uh, it will add dimensions to this. Well, you mentioned that's the what's church, happened at, at Battery Park City. Yeah. You mentioned the church yeah. and of course that raises a very, very ooh, painful wound for many, many people and that was the development of the community center through three or four blocks away from the World Trade Center that was being built by a Muslim community group that was just a real uh, fire storm of, 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 of negativity and, and, and challenging uh, the notion of even the, what is the limit of the World Trade Center site and what religions should be able to manage uh, their, their awareness of that site. And as we know, of course, the Muslim religion is very different from the terrorist groups that attacked uh, that site, these horrible people that did these horrible things. Uh, but still, I, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's culture, culture goes all the way from commerce to, to religion and everything in between. And uh, it's, it, I think the future of the site will, will hopefully um, allow for the world of memory to co coexist beside the world of change. Yes. Absolutely. So um, as we approach the last few minutes of our appointed time, um, there, there is um, one, one question from the audience that seems worth posing because as Lynn lays out in her book and tonight, this, uh, the, this overwhelming um, uh, tragedy and emotion of the families that, that flowed over the site and, and 
washed over so much of the discussion. Um, uh, someone has, has posed the question, have the families, if you can, if they still have a, any kind of monolithic voice, um, do they have a different point of view? And, and uh, you know, have they, they come to an accommodation with the site? Uh, do they consider it successful? How, how does one judge? Um, here, the 20th anniversary, of course, all the eyes of the world were, were directed at ground zero. Um, but one wonders how, um, how diminished in intensity uh, the, the, the public attention was um, and, and equally how much of the family's uh, concentration of emotion still is focused on the site. Does anyone have any sense about that? Well, I just want to, I want to say one caveat to one thing. There was never a monolithic voice to the quote unquote families. There were really several groups of families. There were those who were act, most actively involved and wanted to say in every aspect of the memorial and what would happen on the site. There was another group of families that channeled their emotional loss into the future of uh, of doing things, setting up foundations, working with other other uh, uh, families of, of who had tragic losses, and there was just another set. And I'm I'm simplifying this. Who just needed to get on with their life and just cope at a personal level with the loss. And um, so it's really hard, impossible, and we shouldn't talk about the families in one as a monolithic group. And I, I would, I was not on the site for the 20th anniversary, but there are some families that won't go back to the site at all. So it's, it's hard to know uh, how, how these different groups and, and, and more of the groups within the groups feel 20 years later. There have been a lot of moving stories in the press about the children of the 9-11 families, but uh, I just, it's important to see them as, as diverse groups with different interests. Um, so if there aren't other thoughts, maybe by way of concluding a little bit or wrapping up for the evening, um, it, it seems to me that um, one of the intentions of this program and of the series uh, is is to look back and to consider two decades, but also try to retrieve some of the, um, the indelible, uh, uh, as, as Frank uh, used that word, and the, uh, the intense emotions of the moment. So what happened um, in, those, in those first years, um, we're extremely grateful, um, Craig and Frank to you, um, and Gary too, for your, your firsthand experience and participation in the in the design process, and then and, and then the the planning and the kind of you know focusing um, of the the progress of the master plan. Um, so I'm I'm very pleased that tonight we could get a kind of behind the scenes view of some of these lesser known stories, um, because it seems to me that the that this that the history of um, Ground Zero um, has in the early emotions and the early years of, of the, the site, the kind of glare and blare of the press and the politics on the site that, that Lynn documents um, so well. Um, and that the, um, the celebrity that surrounded the architectural um, uh, competitions um, for Liebskin and Arid and, and um, Snowetta, uh, brought a kind of public attention, but maybe also a superficial understanding of the, the dynamics um, of the design process. So um, Lynn, that's something that you expand on in hundreds of pages. Um, Frank, in, um, in, uh, in millions of dollars, <laughs> addressed um, how one deals with uh, that site. So I, I think you know all of you in, in different ways have so many myriad untold stories um, in a, a, a site which is certainly like no other, um, a span of time.
time and event, which is like no other and which has a history, which is still continuing to unfold. So um, I will invite the audience to come back at the end of October for part two of Ground Zero Master Plans as we look at the skyscrapers, as Craig described them as kind of pointing to the future and as, as are yet still unfinished on the site, just as culture has not come to completion yet on the site um, and, and will evolve. So uh, they also have their, their history and we're going to try to unpack those with um, a panel that includes uh, Bob Lieber, uh, who is Deputy Mayor of, of Development in the uh, Bloomberg administration with Chris Ward, uh, who was overseeing the construction for the um, Port Authority and the World Trade Center site. Uh, with Lynn, of course, who will um, moderate that panel and, and um, lend her real estate know-how to unwrap, unraveling um, those, uh, those stories of the investments and the insurance. Um, and indeed, for the um, insurance issues, uh, representing the um, Silverstein properties was the lawyer Robin uh, Panovka, um, who will also be on the program, along with Ken Lewis from SOM to talk about the design of the skyscrapers um, and how that commercial component needed to be rearranged just as the cultural component um, had so many variations before it was realized. So I um, hope you'll all, this panel will also um, listen in on that evening um, and the audience uh, will come back at the end of October, but also next week um, as we look at the forensic analysis of the collapse of the tower and we think about risk and real estate um, going forward. So thank you all so much, um, Gary and Craig and Lynn and Frank for being with us tonight and sharing your, um, your both emotional and intellectual um, experiences and poetic um, interpretations um, and what you brought to the site. So thank you all um, for this evening and I hope to see everybody again um, in the continuation of this series. So good night, everybody.